Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started. So thank you all for joining us this afternoon at our second annual Leadership and Multi-Faith Program Symposium. We had a rich panel discussion this morning and conversation afterwards, and we look forward to continuing our discussion on food, farming, and faith with our keynote address and a second panel presentation later this afternoon. Before I introduce our keynote speaker, I would like to invite Jacqueline Royster, Dean of the Ivan Allen College of Liberal Arts at Georgia Tech, and Jan Love, Dean of Candler School of Theology at Emory, to offer their welcoming remarks. Dean Royster. Good afternoon, everyone. As Deanna said, I am Jacqueline Jones Royster, Dean of the Ivan Allen College of Liberal Arts at Georgia Tech, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our campus and to the historic Academy of Medicine. Now, if you didn't have time over lunch or you're just getting here, it might be worth your while to, to wander the hall a little bit and see what a special place this is. There are things of interest here. But I always want to point out that in the lobby, you should look up because there's a chandelier there that was actually in the movie Gone with the Wind, and you don't want to miss that. Yeah, it was uh, donated to the Academy by the family of Margaret Mitchell. My deepest pleasure today, though, is to welcome you to the second annual symposium of the Leadership in Multi-Faith Program, Food, Farming, and Faith. The Ivan Allen College is delighted to partner with the Candler School of Theology at Emory University on the LAMP program. It is a wonderful alliance for us, and we take great pride in bringing together Candler's strengths in faith traditions with Georgia Tech's strengths in liberal arts and technology in trying to draw much needed attention to the nature, ways, and means of 21st century leadership a mission that is particularly poignant today with it being Super Tuesday. I hope all of you who are eligible to vote actually did that or will do that before the end of the day in this cycle of the presidential election. If there is one message that we must take away from our 2016 campaign, in my view, it is that we really do need to think long and hard in the United States of America about what the qualities of leadership must entail in our highly complex, greatly challenged, highly technological, multi-faith world with its clear and pressing need for human kindness, grace, respect, reciprocity, and a deeper sensibility to the human condition than uh, seems to be prevailing at the moment. But with that said, we're especially pleased to share with Candler a faculty member, Dr. Deanna Womack. Would you please give her a round of applause? <laughs> she has done such an excellent job in organizing this program. We are grateful to her and our team of Georgia Tech faculty and staff who have worked with her to bring us such an innovative opportunity for conversation and engagement. If you were here this morning, then you already know that the symposium is now deeply embedded in a set of issues about which we should be critically informed and more energized. And I, for one, am very much looking forward to the keynote address and the panel to come. So again, welcome to Georgia Tech and to the LAMP Symposium. We are thrilled that you've taken the time to join us today and I do hope that you enjoy the presentations and discussions this afternoon and that you will always look to LAMP to set a brisk pace as we join hands across sectors and geographical locations to find ways to think well about critical concerns and to figure out how to create greater impact in our desires to make our world a better place. Good afternoon, I wanna add my word of welcome to the eloquent words that we've heard from Jackie Royster and say that it's always such a pleasure, we've only done it two times, but what a joy to see this wide variety of people uh, all interested, keenly interested in this key topic. 
And that's the vision of the LAMP program, is to bring people together across religious lines on pressing matters that concern all of us and on which we hope we can find ways to, forward, uh, to move forward together. We at Candler form Christian leaders for Christian ministries and uh, to partner with a public university uh, in liberal arts is not only a joy, but it's a rare opportunity to um, itself be a model of leadership, something that we're pleased to offer to the city of, La of Atlanta. And I want to just second the assertion that Jackie has made that uh, conversing across deeply held differences such as religious differences often are by their very nature, they are deeply held and they are often very divergent. Finding ways to reach across those divergences and those deeply held differences is one of the skills that I think all leaders of the 21st century must uh, find a way to develop the skills for and to practice on a daily basis. This is the laboratory in which we do it. And uh, there could be nothing more important, I think, for the citizenry of this country and for leaders who expect to go on to uh, themselves help faith communities uh, find their way uh, across multi-religious differences to cooperate in building a common vision for uh, healing and wholeness in our various communities. So I'm delighted you're here. Um, I got a little bit of a taste of the discussion from the morning and look forward very much not only to the keynote speaker but also um, your contributions here. Thanks again to Georgia Tech and Jackie for hosting us in this grand facility. And um, I also want to simply thank Deanna Womack, who's an exceptional uh, gift to both Candler and Georgia Tech. And um, her organization of this conference foretells many wonderful things to come. So welcome. Thank you, Dean Love and Dean Royster. It's now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Rabbi Dr. Jonathan K. Crane. Jonathan is the Raymond F. Shinazi Scholar of Bioethics and Jewish Thought at Emory University's Center for Ethics. He holds a BA from Wheaton College in Massachusetts, an MA in International Peace Studies from the University of Notre Dame in Indiana, and an MPhil in Gand Gandhian Thought from Gujarat Vidyapith in um, Ahmedabad, India. As a Wexler Graduate Fellow, he received both Rabbinic Ordination and a Master of Arts in Hebrew Letters from Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion. And he completed a PhD in Modern Jewish Thought at the University of Toronto. The immediate past president of the Society of Jewish Ethics, he has presented at conferences and taught around the world on such themes as Jewish ethics, bioethics, social and political ethics, warfare ethics, eating ethics, comparative religious ethics, and interfaith relations, and Gandhian philosophy. Jonathan is the author of Narratives and Jewish Bioethics and Ahimsa, The Way to Peace. He's the co-editor with Elliot Dorff of the Oxford Handbook of Jewish Ethics and Morality, and editor of Beastly Morality, Animals as Ethical Agents. His forthcoming books include Eating Ethically, Religious, Philosophical, and Scientific Perspectives on Eating Well, and an edited volume tentatively entitled Race with Jewish Ethics. The title of his address for us this afternoon is Can One Eat Enough? Please join me in welcoming Jonathan Crane. Now it's on. Okay, great. So good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. And hopefully the next uh, 40 minutes or so are, are going to be an, in, uh, an engaging 
um, conversation, but we're going to start off on the road instead of uh, here inside. So who here has a car or has ever been in a car or has ever driven a car that can go approximately 170 miles an hour? Anybody? Or who has a car that can go, say, above 65? Okay, so you all have a vehicle underneath your bum, hands on the steering wheel, and you can, the technology can take you in speeds that you are not legally allowed to go, correct? Now, who here has a watch like this? All right, I, I didn't bring mine, but mine is basically this kind of watch. Um, so this watch, we should note, it, it can go down to 100 meters uh, underwater. Um, who here has ever scuba dived? Okay, how low can you get underwater with basic scuba certification? 30, maybe 40 meters. So my watch can go places that I can't go. My car can go speeds that I'm not legally allowed to go. So we surround ourselves both on the car and on our technologies, and we all have fancy phones and computers that can do such incredible things that we can't actually access or take advantage of. And we take the exciting and we bring it down into the mundane world, and we do the inverse too. We take the mundane thing like ironing and we make it really exciting. This is called the sport of e extreme ironing. I kid you not, it is a, it's soon to be an Olympic sport. We do the same thing of mixing and conflating the extreme and the mundane with our foods. Take the simple, humble pumpkin. And we begin to engage in art with it. We make pictures not just of the imaginary, but perhaps of ourselves, or maybe not. We also grow them to extraordinary sizes, and then we carve them out, and we start paddling around the pond. This is what we do with food stuff, stuff that we eat as well. Take the hot dog eating competition sponsored by your local hot dog company. And the competitors literally stuff themselves silly and we give them trophies. And this is Major League Eating, and it says here, Major League Eaters are the best competitive eaters in the world with the most amazing world eating records possible. They, these are champions. These are warriors. These are weapons of mass digestion. Please notice the corporate sponsor. Major League Eating, and this is, um, I was just checking, this is a, a screenshot from about two years ago. I was checking this week to see who the current sponsors are. Strangely, Pep, Pep, uh, Pepto is no longer a corporate sponsor. But this concern about our maladaptive eating practices is obviously not a new one. Here, um, from about, uh, I cut it off, but this is about 16th century, um, La Cressine Grasse, by um, Peter van der Heyden. We should note how they are looking at, this is called the fat kitchen here. Um, what, what do you just see in this picture here? What are some of the themes that you see prevalent? Okay, so, so we see something about body size is quite curious here. And, and for the most part, most people here are, um, ha have unusually large BMIs. Okay, what else do you notice? Yes, so it's sloppy, it's an uncivilized scene here. There's not a whole lot of table etiquette going on. You can see food falling off, literally falling off the tables. I don't know why it's making these bumps. Sorry about that. Um, and you should note also the, the fat dog. The fat dog um, eat, uh, literally biting the vagabond who seems to be the only individual with a normal BMI being kicked out of the house. All right, so there's the rejection of hospitality being taking place, and of course the fat cat over here is ignoring everybody. Uh, the children are learning how to eat from the floor. So there's something about maladaptive eating going on that has long uh, concerned people, not only in the social arena, but now here's the more famous one by Peter Bruegel uh, called gluttony or gula, 
And he shows that it's not only physically um, maladaptive, but it's also spiritually. It encourages some sort of depravity. We become degenerate uh, when we eat or drink in, in maladaptive ways. We actually engage in, when we are gluttons, we engage in basically a cannibalism of ourselves and our natural environment. And you can analyze these pictures for hours to show that uh, if you engage in unhealthy, um, unethical eating, that you can really destroy oneself. And that's where we're going to be turning our attention. Uh, and just to show that this old concern has also modern ramifications, this is just a map from the CDC, um, just showing that uh, we have increasing levels of BMI over the last uh, 20 odd years, and a direct correlation with increasing uh, di rates of diabetes, which is an eating off, it's, this is uh, diabetes too, an eating related uh, condition. And this is not exhaustive, obviously, it's just illustrative that we are somehow um, literally eating ourselves to death in the contemporary food system. So what I want to spend a few moments right now talking with you about is what are we talking about when we talk about food and eating ethics? And in my studies of this discourse, I, am, I have found that we have at least two, maybe three different discourses occurring simultaneously. One is what I call food ethics. And this morning's panel, I think, spoke pre most predominantly about food ethics. And this tends to focus on such issues as what's happening on farms like seeds and fertilizers, animals and labor issues. They also might be concerned about transportation, whether it's local or if it's being flown by plane or by train or by boat. They might be concerned also about how we manufacture the foodstuffs, the fake foods that we now can buy with barcodes and what kind of preservatives and manipulations are happening within industrial factories. How we package this material, how we market it, how we label it, it's all very confusing um, and brilliant. Uh, how we retail food and how we restaurant our foods. Um, what, literally, when you go into a grocery store, they put certain foods at eye level and other foods are not put at eye level. Not just for you, but also for your children as well. Um, and also in restaurants, how they literally plate the food, whether it's a small plate, a large plate with just a little, little bit of a piece of food. Um, we'll talk about that as well. Uh, and then, when we get to dietetics, I just subdivide dietetics into two different categories. The descriptive side, we also heard a little bit about that this morning, and we'll hear some more of it this afternoon, is what I call food ways. This is where we describe how do Irish Americans eat? How do Jews from the Mediterranean eat? How do Ethiopians eat? And it's describing the history of these food ways, what sort of authorities often uh, prescribe these food ways in the first place, and their fascination with certain kinds of ingredients or taboos of other kinds of ingredients, and what sort of eating regimen might there, might there be. And one of our panelists this morning spoke about the need to fast during Ramadan. That's a regimen that is inherent within the Islamic uh, food way uh, practice. The other kind of dietetic is obviously going to be the prescriptive. These are the diets that are fads, and they prop up once a week, basically. Um, sometimes there's science behind some of these uh, fad diets. Um, oftentimes, there's a smiling celebrity. Um, and they might fixate on a particular ingredient. Who here remembers the palm diet, when pomegranates were really huge? Or broccoli was actually the sexiest thing on the earth for a few years. Um, and now it, it's no longer as sexy for some reason. Um, and or a particular regimen they might be promoting, like the shred diet or the VB6, the vegan before six diet. So all of these are prescribing a certain way of eating in this world. The food ethics conversation focuses, I think, and I, this is gross generalization here, but for the most part is trying to influence how you exercise your wallet and trying to encourage you to exercise your purchasing power a particular way. Whereas dietetics is really trying to understand your notions of identity and the kinds of brands that you align yourself with and how you self-identify. To what degree do you adhere to these particular food ways, whether it's an, a, a traditional one or a, a, a particular fad diet. But most of these conversations, not all, but most of these conversations, for the most part, are getting you 
as uh, Rashid said this morning, from seed to table. They get you, they get, um, they focus your attention on everything from farming to how you get it to your kitchen table. Maybe your cooking practices. But that's where they sell. They don't pay attention to me. They're not concerned about Jonathan Crane. They're concerned about whether I adhere to a particular diet, whether a traditional one or a new one, or I'm exercising my wallet in a particular way, but they're not interested about me being an eater and the practice of me eating the eaten. And so I am trying to, the, the, the remainder of my time is going to be introducing a whole new space in our conversations, trying to introduce the field of eating ethics, a conversation about what does it mean phenomenologically to be an eater, so radically dependent upon this bounteous world that if I didn't consume it, I would die. And that that is what all of us are. We are all eating creatures, whether you want to acknowledge it or not. And we need to figure out how can we eat in this world of excess, of superabundance, of indulgence, and how can we somehow uncover within it the capacity to eat enough. So we all know the, the narrative that Starbucks began their company in Seattle, my hometown. They just began with two sizes, a small and a tall, small and a large it was back then, and they slowly have expanded their, um, their options. There's now a trunte, which is actually exceeds the size of this picture. Um, but studies have just come out, um, and the BBC picked this up last week, that some of the coffees that we might drink from this and other coffee establishments have the same, if not more, sugar content than soda. Uh, and so they found that, for example, if you get a chai latte of this size, you're basically consuming a two liter can of uh, amount of sugars. Um, so we are packing into our foodstuffs, and that's just illustrative. I'm, I'm not going to go exhaust all of the different kinds of food sources, but it's illustrative of both the explosion of the sizes of the food. This is the typical um, hamburger and, and fries and soda drink in the 1950s to now, how our sizes have, have exploded, as well as the caloric um, count. This is something called the, the, the double cheese burger from a uh, hamburger joint up in Massachusetts. This particular thing has a cheese, two cheese um, sandwiches and a uh, hamburger in between. It's only 1,500 calories. Just this one sandwich right here, okay? Um, and we also know that, so we're expanding our food sizes and we're also packing more and more and more um, CRAP, that's a technical term, into our, into our foodstuffs. Um, and this is found pervasively. When you go to a movie, it is now possible for you to get um, in the large size popcorn, if you get it layered with their butter um, flavors, it now has approximately a thousand calories in that one bowl of popcorn. So we're expanding the size and we're packing more um, calories, M many people would call them empty calories, into our foodstuffs. Uh, and we are also eating in a particular way. That's the food stuff uh, that is uh, available to us. But we often eat based on a unit bias. A unit bias is that we buy one of these things of popcorn and we think that that is the unit that we ought to consume. So this here is my bottle of water. Thank you very much, Niana. Um, and it's 16.9 uh, fluid ounces. Why it's not 16.8, I don't know. But it is 16.9 fluid ounces, but this is the unit that I am supposed to drink. Somebody somewhere made the decision that this is what I'm supposed to drink and this is what's healthy for me. Or at least this is what's economical, right? This is called unit bias, that I'm influenced by what is put in front of me. So when I put one of these popcorn bowls in front of my children, that's what they'll eat. If I put a huge hamburger in front of them, that's what they'll eat. We are influenced by the food size that is served to us. 
We're also influenced by the clock. So how frequently we eat. Here in North America, we have been taught culturally to have approximately three meals a day. The food industries now are trying to both expand our meal times as well as interrupt our consumptive moments. We now have coffee right outside here in the, in the foyer in case you should be getting thirsty um, or you need a few extra calories. You can just run outside and get it. Uh, so we're in, interrupting our normal frequency patterns of eating. Also the distribution of foods that we eat during certain days. We have become acculturated to eat certain things during certain times of days and not uh, certain things. So it's rare for the individual to wake up in the morning and have dessert first thing. Uh, but instead of, we, instead of eating a piece of cake, we have some sugar-encoded cereal. There's really no difference calorically or sugar-wise between the two things, but we eat one at one time of the day and the other at another time of day. We are also influenced by the diets that are promulgated by our governments and our cultures. Am I doing something wrong? Oh, thank That's you. Okay. That would be great. Thank you. Um, so the recommended daily allowance is another opportunity that is influencing us from the outside about what to eat and how much to eat and when to eat it. And we're also influenced by events. Thanksgiving is the opportunity for you to eat yourself silly. Uh, and it's opulent. Um, Fourth of July. We just had the, the Super Bowl. These are major events in our calendar year, and obviously there are religious events um, that have certain foodstuffs and, and feasts that are uh, part of them. Uh, but all of these are external ways to tell us what to eat, when to eat, how to eat, and with whom to eat. And of course, we've got the big old uh, economic influence uh, that is uh, impacting our food choices. But for the most part, all of these influences are external cues telling us what to eat, when, and how. That's in the contemporary circumstance. A few years ago, a guy named Aristotle um, was suggesting a, a different way of thinking about our, um, the way that we walk in this world, the way that we eat in this world, and he promoted this virtue called temperance. And he situated it between two extremes that you can eat too little and you can eat too much. You can have too, much, too little wine, you can have too much wine. And that the temperate individual, the virtuous guy or woman, is the person who eats between these two extremes. But while that sounds logical and reasonable, it is still nonetheless um, operating a based on an, exter an orientation based on external cues. And so you would imagine that the person who uh, would have the option of eating these different kinds of uh, oatmeal would choose to go with the middle one. But we have a test case um, called the Goldilocks Principle. And we know that, first of all, if she were really inspired by her economic choices, so that she would have chosen the largest of the bowls because it was a free meal. And that that's the one that she would have consumed completely. But she didn't. If she were con really concerned by the dietary um, advice of the day, she would have chosen the more uh, me intermediate size, so as not to be too excessive. But instead, what she chose is the smallest bowl. And so the real question is why? Why did Goldilocks? You laugh. This, this is a serious test case. Why did Goldilocks choose the smallest bowl? Well, I'm going to suggest that she was um, trying to listen to internal cues about what would satisfy her. And contemporary science of satisfaction, when it comes to eating, has divided the world into two different kinds of satisfaction. There is the kind that is found within the meal, and they have a fancy term for it, it's called prandial, and that is called satiation. And there's an inverse relationship going on. At the beginning of a meal, you're really hungry, it's way up here. And as you begin to take your food, your, your satiation slowly increases until they finally meet, and you have satisfied yourself within the meal. You're no longer hungry. Many of us continue to eat, even though our hunger has been abated. So satiation begins the time, at the moment that you began eating a particular meal. 
and you are satiated when you actually stop eating a meal. Then becomes the state of satiety, postprandial satiety. It is the state of being sated. You're satisfied. You don't need to eat anything. Your biology, your organism tells you you have enough caloric intake and, and proteins and nutrients for homeostasis. You're fine. You don't need to eat another thing, your body is telling you. And that is called satiety. And that will continue on until you get to preprandial society and your hunger begins to escalate again and you start another eating event. Our contemporary food culture is trying to both expand your meal so that you eat empty calories. Take Cheetos, for example, as a wonderful example. They be melt as soon as they go in your mouth and they crush down when they get to your belly. So you have to eat a bag this big in order to get the caloric intake for your body to do what it needs to do. So they're and it will take you longer time to eat that massive bag. So they're trying to expand the time that you actually sit there stuffing your mouth, and then they're trying to interrupt your, your satedness. So if any of you have ever wandered around a big, say, school of higher education, and you'll see that there are vending machines every 20 feet, or in a local hospital, um, they also have vending machines uh, every so often. Um, take it, go down to the airport, go down uh, most any street here. Uh, we're trying to figure out ways to nudge you and give you another opportunity to have another consumptive moment of either liquid or solid or something in between. But these are the uh, internal cues that scientists um, are now studying. And so I want to now bring that field of satisfaction studies into uh, eating ethics. And I want to focus first on why we should think about ourselves as eaters. As you well know, at least in the Judaic textual tradition, which is the one I'm most familiar with, and also in the um, Christian and Islamic traditions, there is this notion of creation. It, it, at least in the biblical tradition, the first creation story um, has a primordial responsibility for humankind, which is to procreate. Pru or vu, please propagate yourselves, it says. Um, and you are permitted to uh, empower yourselves with, by consuming certain things. You're supposed to eat seed-bearing plants and trees. And you are permitted to eat until you are basically sick so that you can continue to propagate because that's your primary responsibility. There is no notion in Genesis chapter 1 of any kind of consequence of going wrong in this story. But as we well know, this is not the only creation story. And the reason why I'm focusing on the creation stories is that this here is showing that at least, from the, at least in Judaism and Christianity, from the get-go, these ancient religious traditions understand that the ontology, the reason at why homo sapiens are the way that we are, is uh, bound up in our eating practices. In the second creation story, which is found in Genesis 2 and 3, um, the primordial responsibility is not to procreate, but to steward the land. And you are granted to eat certain things, and those are certain seedy things again. But here we have uh, the, the plants that are um, described uh, fall into three major categories. Those things, those trees that are aesthetically pleasing to the eye, those that are nutritionally beneficial, and the two special trees. The special tree of, what are the two special trees? Knowledge of good and evil and the tree of immortal life. Exactly. So those are the two special trees. So there are three categories of trees planted in the Garden of Eden. We've got the Twinkies, we've got the Kales, and we've got the Don't Touch. However, God stipulates that you are only permitted to eat certain things. And if you eat maladaptively, then there's going to be a, a terminus called death. So there are serious consequences, conceptually, that are found in the second creation story that are completely unintelligible to the first creation story. But again, in both creation stories, eating looms large. It is the first moral issue, specifically, especially in the cre second creation story, um, for all of humankind to wrestle with. But it's not the last creation story. I think there are, there's another one. The third creation story, 
which is actually the recreation of the world, which is, surrounds Noah and the flood. And finally, Noah is liberated from the confines of the ark, and all of the natural world is liberated after the flood. And again, eating looms large in this new creation story here. And new permission is granted. Human beings are permitted to eat flesh for the first time. It is a concession given by God to humankind that they may now eat flesh. But however, there is a limit. Human beings are not permitted to eat the blood of the animals they wish to consume. They're not required to consume it, but they um, are permitted to. So this is a third creation story. I think there's even a fourth one. And this one uh, pertains not so much to all of humankind, but to specifically the Israelite people, when they are liberated from the enslavery in Egypt. And in that moment, in Exodus chapter 12, there is a prescription about how Jews are actually to liberate themselves. They're supposed to do it by eating. In the middle of the night, they're supposed to offer up the Paschal lamb. And they are supposed to eat this Paschal offering. And the text delineates in great detail how they're supposed to do it. They're basically supposed to do it in haste, as if preempting 21st century life. But what's interesting here is now flesh is no longer permitted but required for this particular liberatory moment. But there is a limit. No, nothing is supposed to be left over from this particular eating moment, which suggests because of the centrality of this particular moment in the uh, evolution of the Israelite and the Jewish community is that this is a special eating moment. All other eating moments, leftovers, will have a role to play, and that's foreshadowing. So now, eating, so eaters loom large in both the cosmology of the natural world as well as uh, the, the first three creation stories, as well as within the creation of the Jewish people itself. Now, what does eating look like? So um, let's start with Noah. Noah is instructed before going onto the ark to store up everything that all animals, including his family, are going to be consuming when they're on that ark. So in order to store it up, he had to take a look at how the worms ate, how the giraffes ate, how um, the hippopotami ate, and how his own family ate, and figure out how much they would all need and store it all up. I hope he had good refrigeration. Joshua, just after the demise of Moses at the end of Deuteronomy, he becomes the next leader of the Israelites. He goes around to all the Israelites that are about to cross over into the land of Jordan, and he says, get provisions ready because we're about to go conquer this land and take it because it's our achuzah, our God-given uh, gift for being uh, the Israelites. Um, but again, it meant that all of the tribes had to figure out how much they were going to consume on this journey for who knows how long. They had to do some serious calculations. And Moses, too, told this to the people um, as they were about to engage in that fateful night of the uh, death of the firstborn and the liberation of the Israelite people. Again, getting back to the Paschal Lamb, each family member is to take their particular portion and divide it evenly amongst all of the family members. All of these instances, and there are a few more, are talking about the notion of rationing food. And if you are going to be rationing food, you need to eat in moderation. And you can tell that ration is etymologically linked to moderation. But what does it mean to eat moderately? Well, thankfully, the prophet Elijah never died. The prophet Elijah, at least in the Bible, never dies, and so he is given a couple of tasks in the Jewish textual tradition and liturgical tradition, and this is a conversation that he has with Rabbi Nathan in the Talmud. He comes to teach Rabbi Nathan, eat a third, drink a third, retain a third, for when you become angry, you'll be filled to your capacity. What does that mean? Can anybody help me? Drink a third, eat a third, drink a third, retain a third. Is this referring to the plate that we just had at lunch? That you're supposed to leave food and drink on, on the table? Is it about external cues? Well, this is not only a Jewish teaching. It is also found in Hadith literature. A man does not fill any vessel worse than his stomach. It is sufficient for the son of Adam to eat enough to keep him alive, but if he must eat, 
then one third for his food, one third for his drink, and one third for his air. So this notion of eating two thirds, eating and drinking two thirds is found within at least Jewish and Islamic textual traditions. Thankfully, we have an, a medieval uh, exegete who comes along, his name is Rashi, Rabbi Shimon ben Yitzchaki in France, and he says, um, he's uh, talking about when you become angry. He says, anger fills your belly to your capacity. So if you fill your belly and innards with food and drink, when you become angry, you will split asunder. We should not laugh too much, because what they are doing is they are working within a Homeric notion of physiology. Homer believed that there are the four humors, if you recall, the four humors, and even your emotions were biological things that you had to metabolize. And so if you filled 100% of your belly with organic stuff, you had no physical space to digest the, the emotional life that you have. So in other words, um, one of the ways that I reframe that is that if you fill your belly with biology, you have no room for your biography. In order for you to have a biographical life, an emotional life, an intellectual life, you have to leave some physical space for you to literally move around. Who here has ever wheezed your way over to the couch after Thanksgiving because you've stuffed yourself silly? You can't, you're uncomfortable. You don't want to be disturbed. You don't want to even watch the football game because you're so uncomfortable. It would be getting too, too riled up. You have to leave some physical space in order for you to have an emotional life. This is picked up by the medieval uh, physician and sage Maimonides in his Mishnah Do'ot, Mishnah Torah, excuse me, and he teaches that, well, frankly, the two-thirds analysis is too stringent. He would rather say, you're permitted to eat, um, up to, eat and drink up to three-fourths of your belly. This is picked up again by Al-Ghazali just a, a, a few years later um, in his book on disciplining the soul. And he says that there's actually some other traditions of, of Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, that he was teaching that, frankly, you should eat and drink only up to half of your belly. So we have three different moments within at least the Jewish and the Islamic textual traditions where they are all saying that in order for you to eat well, to eat like a sage, they say, to eat righteously, to eat holy, is to eat less than what your belly can actually retain. So what is it that you're supposed to actually eat? What is the tension? If, is there a tension in these textual traditions between the quality of the food stuff that you actually put into your gut and the quantity? We all have already heard one of the opinions, and they all agree that whatever you eat, it should be less than 100% of what your belly can retain. So what is the relationship with the quality? Well, Maimonides comes back, and he says that, frankly, taking a little food of bad quality is less harmful than taking much good and laudable food. Whoa. This is because when a man takes bad foods and does not overeat, they are digested well and the organs derived from them all that would be beneficial. The expulsive faculty, I love that phrase, the expulsive faculty is strengthened and expels their e evil superfluities, and no damage at all occurs, or if any occurs, it's not serious. But when you eat to repletion, he says, even if it is well, with well-prepared bread and laudable meat, the digestion will in no wise progress well. So physicians warn against overeating and recommend actually just having one dish. He then goes on to say, he summarizes this teaching in his uh, compendium of, Jude, of Jewish law that overeating is like a deadly poison to the human body. It's the essence of all ailments. And we know that the, of the top four, of the 10 top killers here in the United States, four of them are from food and consumptive related uh, practices. For most illnesses, he says, that come upon humans are caused only by harmful foods or, and this is the point, filling the belly with overeating even of healthy foods. So when he is talking about that there's a danger in eating too much, he is applying that not just to too much bad food, 
but also to good quality foodstuffs that our panel this morning was just talking about. And how important it is for us to be growing and participating in food systems that produce good quality foodstuffs. Why would Maimonides say something like this? Where he is saying it would be better for you to eat a little bit of bad CRAP than to eat really good organic materials. That's because he had never met this. In his day, livestock and agriculture were not the moral conundrums that we face. In his day, he knew precisely how his chickens and sheep and goats were being fed because he was feeding them. He was raising them and he was slaughtering them. He knew precisely the fact that what they ate, he would eventually eat. And so he made sure that their eating and their quality of lives were as good as he wanted it for himself. The modern CAFO system, the modern agricultural system is an invention of the last hundred years and we must wrestle with those uh, elemental uh, facts. Maimonides uh, is not uh, providing us guidance on that particular front. And so that's why this conversation about eating ethics needs to supplement and complement the food ethics conversations where we're talking about how do we get the food from farm to fork. But this is perhaps the best story of all by Al-Ghazali. It is told that Al-Rashid once summoned four physicians from India, a Greek, an Iraqi, and a Sawadi, which is also in Iraq. And he said to them, here's the challenge. Let each of you describe that medicine, which itself results in no sickness. You should recognize that the word pharmacy comes from the ancient Greek pharmakeia, which means poison. Anyway, um, so he is asking, here's the challenge. Describe that medicine, which results, it itself results in no sickness. So the Indian said, well, obviously it's black myroba, I can't even pronounce it, black myrobalan, um, which would help actually release stools. Uh, the, the Iraqi said, it's actually the nasturtium cress. And whereas the Greek said, well, obviously it's hot water. That will create no sickness. Um, and it's the best medicine. The Sawadi said, no, 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 no. These all have problems. They will all make you sick if you have too much of them. The medicine which contains no sickness consists in refraining from food until one has an appetite and in ceasing to eat when one is not yet full. And Rashid says, you win the contest. In other words, refrain from food until you have an appetite. That is describing the state, the state of satiety. Don't start eating, don't snack until you're actually hungry and to cease eating before you get full. In other words, when you are sated in the meal, put down your fork. Don't continue eating, even though there might still be food left on your plate. If there is food left on your plate, I think we can then turn to the Christian textual tradition. And this is the moment found when Jesus is schlepping through the Galilee, and there are, for some reason, 5,000 people who are quite curious about him, and so they are his tag-along. And he sits down, and um, the 5,000 come around him, sit around, and say, okay, teach us something, what's up? Uh, and so he tells his disciples to feed these 5,000 people, and they did not know how to feed the 5,000. It turns out that one of the fellows nearby had just a few loaves and some fish. And so Jesus then said, okay, well, we'll take this food that we do have and we'll feed all 5,000. And that's the miracle that is found within the New Testament. Or at least that's what we've been taught is the miracle, is that he took these loaves, he gave his thanks, he, he did the birkat hamazon before the meal, um, and then he had them distributed. So this is what's so fascinating. He, he distributed it, all the food to those who were seated, including the fish, as much as they wanted, they took. And when they were satisfied, like that term, he told his disciples, now go and collect all the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. And they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they were able to fill 12 more baskets to feed the disciples. And for many of us, we read that as 
an interpretation of a miracle that Jesus was able to provide so much food for 5,000 people out of just a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. Yes, that is miraculous, but for me, what I find even more miraculous is that there were leftovers in the first place. The Jews took what they wanted, but they ate less than what they took. There were leftovers. They didn't eat themselves until they were full. They ate until they were sated. And this story that, about Jesus echoes the one of Elisha found in the book of 2 Kings, where he too was surrounded by a thousand people. And he said to somebody nearby um, who had grain and 20 loaves of barley bread, and he said, give to the people so they can eat. And he said, what? Feed 100 people with only this little amount of food? And Elisha said, give it to the people so they can eat. Everyone will eat, God says, and there will be remains. And when they gave it to the people, they ate and there were remains, just as God had said. That's the miracle, is that if you eat less than what you can, there will be leftovers. If you eat enough, there will be enough for others to eat, these textual traditions are suggesting. And so if we explore, and this is just a preliminary exploration into the field of eating ethics, if we explore what it means to be an eater, somebody radically dependent upon the natural world, which we must take into our organic bodies, and if we eat well, and if we eat that which is designed to be eaten, then there might be a way for you and me to be brought into these larger conversations alongside the food justice, the food ethics conversations, as well as the dietetic conversations. You and I then appear in this conversation, and we will actually be able to eat enough. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for a thought-provoking and engaging talk. Um, we're going to do as we did after our last panel. We have um, three community respondents. Do you want to stand on the floor to respond, or you can oh. stay up at, um, at the podium as you like? Uh, so our first is David Addis. So we'll, um, we'll listen to all three of you and then give Jonathan an opportunity to respond. And the microphone. Thank you, Dr. Crane. That was really spectacular and, and very thought-provoking. Uh, as I sat here and listened, a few things came to mind and wanted to uh, raise these. I'm impressed with how that which is most personal and deeply inner in our lives is also universal. And your talk really ties together the importance of the personal and how we approach food on a personal level and the local and global levels as well. I, I like the idea of, of eating ethics, and the ethics that you talked about you know, is, gets to this core question of how should we live, both as individuals in relation to our environment and, and in relation to uh, the world that we live in. The idea of nutrition um, and gluttony and deprivation, you, you spoke about in terms of food, but there are also um, certainly other parts of our lives and our society have these elements as well. And we're bombarded by external cues, not only about food, but about so many other things. And I wonder the extent to which our struggles with food and our avoidance of paying attention to the internal cues around food and satiety are also spelled out and occur in these other aspects of our lives as well. Um, this, this sort of internal paying attention to the internal cues reminded me uh, of the, the Zen monk with a begging bowl who seems to rise in the morning and the, the hunger kicks in and has faith that the food will be provided. He lives in a society where that food is provided. It's one meal a day and is, is satisfied. And I wonder what it would take for those, for those of us who are not Zen monks to have that same level of uh, um, 
conditioning and awareness of the internal cues and how that might uh, change how we relate to, to food. My final question is really about the, how do we, in our world today, pay more attention to these internal cues? Uh, how do we step away from the bombardment of the external cues? Are there certain practices? You alluded to this in some of the scriptures and the traditions, but are there, is there a greater level of instruction for those of us as individuals to pay more attention to these internal cues and to uh, take the advice that you uh, offered? Finally, uh, you touched on this issue of generosity with the loaves and the fishes and this, this sharing uh, and some people interpret that parable as, as a, an example of, of generosity and sharing. Uh, the, the personal aspects of the ethics that you raise also have implications for us um, in society. And your talk focused largely on the abundance of food. But because of the distribution, it's not equal. We also are aware that there's deprivation as well. But here again, this internal psychological dimension, our relationship to food as individuals, is played out at a societal and global level. And I wonder if you could address that. Thank you. And if you would pass the microphone on to Amy, and um, please introduce yourself before giving your question. Sure. Uh, my name is David Addis. I'm at the Task Force for Global Health at Emory University. Amy Webb Gerard, um, the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University in the Nutrition and Health Sciences Program. And thank you very much, Jonathan. It's always a pleasure to, to hear you speak, and it's always an honor to, to be side by side with you teaching and, and learning. Um, and thank you very much, Dr. Addis, for your comments. Um, as a public health practitioner, and one who works in the field of diet, nutrition, obesity, overweight, in the context of the U.S., undernutrition, maternal and child starvation in developing country contexts, the issue of abundance and deprivation and how they even work side by side in the same households is stark in many places where I work. Um, through the course of the conversation, several themes kept coming up, and there were the issues around discipline, morality, and temperance in an era of food ubiquity, in an era of food abundance. And when I look at the public health research around obesity in the US, and as someone who works in food insecurity, I also see the conversations around how deprivation actually can contribute to overweight and obesity. When people lose agency and choice and what that does to their mental health, and the translation of that into a physical health condition, then sometimes the conversations around discipline, morality, and temperance may create greater stigma and even greater mental health burden on populations who may already be extremely burdened. Um, we were commenting earlier around how we make recommendations to populations that may not have the means to meet those recommendations and what that might do to them at an emotional level and at a mental health level. And is that ethical? And is that eating ethically? Um, and how can we create an, a community of mindful eating where we recognize ourselves as eaters, but while also working to shift the injustices in the system that disallow people the agency they need to also be mindful eaters and ones who can act on eating ethically? Thank you, Amy. Could you pass the mic to John behind you in the second row? First, I just want to say it was a fantastic presentation. I appreciate the stimulating stimulating ways that you nudged us forward. I also really appreciate what I think was pretty good economic analysis of the entire subject. And uh, I want to note that in particular because I think that uh, we could all benefit from doing more of that. So I really appreciate that you did it. Um,
who we are as eaters and what we eat and what the things we eat, what we think about those things, how we value those things. Um, it's really interesting to hear the, the way you pulled forward the three different traditions um, and found it. I'm wondering, uh, I'd like to hear if there were other ways that you thought about pulling out of those traditions. Uh, I, I mean, I thought, I, I had no idea about um, the one-third, one-third, or three-fourths, or whatever um, sort of approaches. That was really interesting to hear, but I'm wondering if you had also considered other other lessons and other ways that, that we might be informed from our traditions. For example, something I'm always harping on as a Christian pastor, sorry, I'm supposed to introduce myself. I'm John Werbel, and I'm the pastor at William Mennonite Church. We have a nine-acre farm at the church, which means I sometimes slaughter animals and sometimes try to sell chickens, and it's all sorts of crazy things that go along with it. Um, but but as I as as I as I think about this, I'm always harping on the, for Christians, for example, on the ways incarnation lends itself as a Christian topic toward this subject. Because we talk about ourselves, we talk about Christ as God in flesh. And there are lots of arguments for why God might have come and taken flesh, some of which in dominant evangelical ideas are that they that God came to die for us. Mennonite tradition might say, well, maybe God came to live for us and show us how to live in our lives. And so I wonder if you considered following up on some of those. I can think of Jewish ideas. Um, I don't know that much about Islam, I'm afraid, um, enough to comment or, or to suggest ideas, but I can think of some of those, um, some of the being created and, and being in the creation as, as being issues. Um, I also wonder, your model, like I said, was, was um, economic, economical in its, its analysis, um, but it's still very much focused on our consumptive side. And what I really enjoyed about the morning, and what I wonder is if you've considered really focusing on the productive side, and sort of flipping this a little bit, because it struck me that you were dead on with the ways we need to think about the food system. And you were talking, is it Anne? Amy, about creating a community of mindful eaters one of the things that was most amazing about Maimonides is that he had to kill his own chickens. How can we possibly be creative, a community of mindful eaters, if we aren't also developing and using those agrarian skills that we talked about this morning? If we aren't also creating places for that kind of knowledge and that kind of, that kind of experience, Because we talk about it as though it's only farmers that should be doing that, and I'm pretty sure we're not going to succeed if we depend on farmers alone. I don't think farmers can possibly produce a mindful eating community for us, or economy. So I don't know if you could speak to that. Great. These are wonderful, thought-provoking questions. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, just to answer a few of the concerns, um, you're absolutely right. This is not a panacea. Uh, I, and I'm never pretending uh, to, to suggest that this um, conversation about eating ethics is a panacea. Um, many people are forced to eat a particular diet in certain ways because of socioeconomic circumstances, education, locale, etc. It's hugely complicated. Um, but for those of us who have the luxury of choice, um, who have a, a few extra pennies in our wallets, um, who have a vehicle that can drive 170 miles an hour, um, who have the time, like that watch, to go shopping. We have the luxury of choice, and therefore our choices bespeak our values and our commitments. And if we are making certain ethical decisions by not paying attention to what we eat and how we source it, then that 
says a lot about our values and our commitments, about the food that we eat and, and our relationship to the natural world, which we must consume lest we die. And so what I'm suggesting is that for those of us who do have the, the luxury of choice, we also have the responsibility to critically engage our choices. So my conversation is not meant for everybody. My conversation is not meant for those who are, whose BMIs might be influenced because they're taking medications, or they might have predilections, or genes that predispose themselves. So there, there's a whole host of reasons why people's health is, um, is perhaps skewing towards the unhealthy side. Uh, and it's not only related to about soulful um, or personal discipline that I'm talking about. Um, but that's why it is called an eating ethics. It's because the, the capacity to one to, that one can discipline oneself, that is an ethic. It, it invokes the ancient Greek notions of the virtues. It is a form of excellence. And I think though, that those of us who have the economic and um, wherewithal to participate in this kind of exercise, I think that it behooves us to, um, to challenge ourselves to, to make those uh, choices um, more conscientious. We should note, I want to answer some of your questions sort of collectively. We should note that all of these textual traditions that I was drawing on emerged in socioeconomic and food systems circumstances of extraordinary uncertainty and vulnerability. They did not have crop insurance. They did not have transportation systems. They did not have refrigeration systems. They did not have the freezing capacities that we do today. They didn't have the preservatives that we do today. And so they were even more dramatically exposed to the vagaries of the natural environment than we are today. And despite that, or precisely because of that context, they created a food ethic that says, don't eat everything that you bodily can. It's not saying don't have a feast. On the contrary, these religious traditions all regulate feasts. Thumbs up on feasting, but don't do it every single day. That's what they're saying. And yet we now live in a, a, a food system a food environment where it says, feast every day, multiple times a day, good thing, spend some more money. And what I'm suggesting is that if this ethic of eating less than what bodily can emerged in a socioeconomic time of scarcity, all the more so perhaps we can derive some wisdom from it. Maybe not wholesale, but partially we can derive some wisdom of it for our era of superabundance today. And yes, not everybody has access to the superabundance. And so we need to have the conversation, like this morning's, about food justice systems, about access, and getting back to the production side. Who is actually producing foods? We definitely need to have that conversation. And I'm not trying to supplant that conversation, but to suggest another way of talking about food and eating and farming that brings you and me into the conversation. Let me get back to about you and me. No diet out there, whether it's the RDA or the Atkins, no diet has Jonathan Crane in mind. They are in thinking about an average consumer, a statistic. But they're not thinking about me and my peculiar body, my biography, my inability to consume something because I have an allergy, or I have an injury, or I exercise a particular way, and therefore I need to consume particular things. They are not thinking about me in my uniqueness. Eating ethics can. Eating ethics empowers each of us to think about what does my body need today? How can I feed my body? Not the average Atkins or Oprah or the RDA diet body, but mine. Because mine is unique. And therefore, I need to eat uniquely. And so what is enough for me is not going to be enough for Deanna. It's not going to be enough for anybody else. It's enough for me. And so it empowers the individual eater to recognize herself and himself as an eater and not just somebody who's buying into a particular diet or a particular food way, but as a consumer, an individual unique consumer within, that, uh, in, within this world. Um, I think getting back on the pro production side of things, one of the great things that we haven't yet plumbed is what Maimonides has to teach about being an urban agriculturalist. He has in his uh, very short letter called uh, The Regimen of Health, um, he has instructions in there about how to be an urban farmer, how to grow your own food and how to have chickens 
and to feed them appropriately, or chickens. Um, so that he knew that what he eats, eats he will Ill also eat. Uh, and I think that we should be recapturing some of this uh, medieval wisdom. And certainly Al-Ghazali and many others from the medieval period were writing quite a bit about um, these issues as urbanization became more intense. Um, getting back to that uh, Zen monk um, about eating once a day, again, I would say uh, the individual eater um, is acculturated within their context about how much they eat, when and where and with whom and how. Um, but again, I'm going to say I don't want to eat like a Zen monk. I don't think that it's healthy for me to eat as a Zen monk. Um, I need more calories spread throughout the day. And so I'm not going to be a Zen monk in that way, dietarily. So I'm going to eat differently. It doesn't mean that I can't appreciate what Zen monks do dietarily, but I need to eat enough for me, just as you, David, need to eat enough for yourself and not perhaps it is or is not like a Zen monk. Um, and the notion of generosity and hospitality, uh, the Jesus story, um, it's beautiful, an outrageously uh, beautiful and deep story. And one of the things that I have learned from it is uh, the, the um, ancient Latin and Greek words for hospitality and hostel um, means both guest and host simultaneously. The host and the person who comes to a hostel, they're etymologically related. And this is found, and same with a hospital and a hospice. Um, hospitality. Somebody who receives hospitality goes to a hospital, the one who receives them. Um, and this is also found in the Hebrew as well. Um, to be a guest is an orach, oreach, um, and hachnasat orchim, to welcome the guest. But to be a host is to be a meoreach, the one who receives the guest. Now we should link, note that, that, that the, these terms for guest and host are mirror terms for each other, but they also have a link with food, just with Jesus. To be a host, Jesus is the consummate host, right? Uh, Jesus, and, and he gives himself over to be eaten. And the people who eat him, they live on in him, even though he is inside of them. Very powerful theology there. Um, but even in the Hebrew, to uh, the word for meal is um, aruchat eruch, to uh, an evening meal. And it's the same root as guest and host. There is something about being a guest and being a host around food. And there is something beautiful there going on. That food is the way that we engage in commensality, to eat with each other, to be companions, to break bread with each other. Uh, and hospitality and generosity, I think, intertwine beautifully with food and eating. Um, more can be said, but I want to hear other questions here from, from the audience. So we have time. Um, Bruce, we'll take your question, and then after that, we're going to close, and we'll have um, a time for coffee, if your internal cues are leading you that way. <laughs> um, if not, thank, thank you so much, Jonathan, for your insight. We're going to start our second panel at um, 3.30. And so please stay here, um, stand up and stretch, follow up with Jonathan if you have other questions, but um, we'll hear from Bruce. You mentioned the role of fasting or cleansing in this. I mean, Jesus uh, fasted for 40 days. There's the uh, Passover tradition. I just went through a cleanse and a fast. It just brings you so mindfully back to, you know, what you're eating and stuff. We don't seem to have that tradition. And... Uh, I know some friends and stuff in, in Europe, uh, you know, they go once a year to a place called Buchenlinger up in Switzerland where uh, it's a cure for, you know, you go fast for, you know, you go pay a lot of money to not eat anything. So that's, that's basically it. Fasting, again, uh, we should recognize that most religious traditions and civilizations around the world um, have regulated eating. Uh, there are times to eat a normal diet, whatever it happens to be for that geological terrain, but then there are times when it, you're required to feast uh, and eat a lot and have opulence around you. Uh, and then there are times when you are to fast and not eat a lot or drink a lot. And every civilization has a mix of these things. And that variety is uh, distributed throughout a calendar year, 
And we measure, following Mary Douglas, the anthropologist of meals, um, among other things, uh, it, it's that we are able to ascertain what this meal is right now based upon the biggest meal in our calendar year. And so once we have that in our mind, we operate, we can measure everything else against that meal. Um, and that includes our fasts as well. Uh, some, we, at least in the Jewish tradition, we have a, a, the biggest fast is Yom Kippur, where we don't eat and drink for 25 hours. Uh, and then we have minor fasts. And it's called minor, not because it's hard, it's just less hard than the, the full fast of Yom Kippur, that, that are half days. Um, but we also have something called break fast, called breakfast. But if you're snacking in the middle of the night, it's not a break fast. You're just having another snack a few hours later. Um, so in order for break fast to actually be breakfast, you have to not eat after you stop eating dinner. Allow yourself to be sated. Thank you. We're going to close for our break, but please feel free to stay to ask um, Jonathan more questions informally, and we'll come back at 3.30 with our afternoon panel. Thank you all.